For those of you who aren't aware, I was fortunate enough to interview Sam at this conference three years ago. We never met, but I had this shtick where I said, you know, we're just going to pretend like it's just two buddies getting together over drinks to uh, talk about investing. And to break the ice, I made these hats, and the hat said, Zell Cooperman Best Buds. You know, and I thought I'd give Sam the hat, we'd have a little laugh, um, and then we would move on. But Sam kind of took the hat and he put the hat on, and then we both wore the hats for the, uh, for the entire uh, interview, which was great. It really, it, it, bro it broke the ice quite nicely. Um, he was a real sport and we had a ton of fun. And just for a second, I need to divert. Speaking of best buds, there's, I just want to point out somebody in here who's not my best bud, and that's Mo. When Sam was last here, we talked about your music boxes. And I, I made a joke that, you know, now that we're best buds, I'm assuming I'm going to be on your annual uh, music box list. Um, and I haven't confirmed exactly what happened, but I'm pretty sure it went something like this. Sam goes back to Chicago and he says to somebody in his office, you know that nice young man from Toronto, the really smart, good-looking guy? Um, send him a music box, my new best bud. Send him a music box. And then, I don't know if you know anybody else who might meet that criteria. Um, I'll give you a hint, short, puppy dog blue eyes, very engaging, probably the, you're the reason, he's the reason you're here today. Anyway, two weeks later, Mo sends me a video on his phone. He's got this music box sitting on his desk and he's taunting me with it. And Mo, you stole my music box. Um, so now we're, we're uh, we have beef. And so what I've decided to do today is I think we're going to rebrand this conference. This is not the um, Moe's Investment Conference. This is the uh, Sam and Cooper and Evan three-year reunion party of being best buds. So can we just hit the little video, please? So welcome everybody to the Zell Cooperman reunion party. <laughs> about the hats, uh, my former friend Mo was not thrilled about the hats. He told me we looked really stupid on the video when we were wearing the hats. Um, and then, so I went on to YouTube and I, I checked. If you, if you type in Sam Zell on YouTube, the top viewed video, other than the one where you're dropping an F-bomb on a reporter, is our interview in our hats. Okay, so you can check it on YouTube. It's on the, the Prime Quadrant one has about 32,000 views, and then there's another one called the Investor's Archive that's got 77,000 views, but it's our, it's our video. So, you know, obviously, I had to have hats made again. Since the video didn't work, I'm glad we got the hats. So, Ricky, can you please just bring up the hats? Um, Mo gave me specific instructions that we shouldn't wear the hats. Um, but, you know, Sam, oh, there you go. He's wearing it already. I was going to say that uh, if Sam I puts... An Problem. You have an authority problem. Well, look, yeah, if, I was going to say, if you put the hat on and you drop an F-bomb today, we could probably become insta-famous and have a reality show yeah. together. Um, okay, we're wearing the hats. That's great. Let's get into the meat. Thank you for being a good sport. So I want to start with the book. Am I being too subtle? I don't know if you guys can see this. I've read it twice, and from all the bookmarks in there, there really is a ton of valuable information in here, so I, I highly suggest you read it. So why the title? Well, I uh, thought about the message that I was trying to get delivered, and I thought about my experience with people over the years, and the pride I took in the fact that no one, I don't think, has ever left a meeting with me and said, what do you think he meant? <laughs> and. You know, I often, you know, look at them and after I explain my position, and I say, am I being too subtle? I could talk slower, but I got to make sure that the guy on the other side got the message, even if he doesn't like it. I love it. And I saw that I was preparing for this. I watched the Milken, con the Milken conference, and there was, a, there was a thing there where you did that. You were kind of like taking a position with somebody else, and he, he wasn't really agreeing with you. And then you kind of, I, I don't think he was expecting you to be as well versed as you were, because you just started like hammering with all these statistics and kind of proved him wrong. And then you said, am I being too subtle? It was great. So, uh, without giving away too many details in the book, because I want everybody to read it, but maybe you can share a couple of the attributes uh, of success in your life that you've, uh, that you've achieved. Well, I mean, uh, the book is an attempt by an entrepreneur 
uh, to share um, a bunch of ideas through examples and lessons learned. And uh, you know, you read you know something like this, and I hope you'll see that uh, more than anything else, I was a professional opportunist, and I focused on observing and recognizing opportunities and then executing accordingly. It wasn't always easy, it wasn't always clear, it wasn't always successful, but it was an attempt to uh, meld my experience. I mean, I was born 90 days after my parents came to the United States, so I grew up as a real immigrant's kid. Uh, with all the pluses and the minuses, but uh, that also gave me levels of motivation uh, that I didn't have too many comparables for. So I think the idea was that somebody would be able to read this, uh, they would get a sense of, uh, of what and why, and uh, you know what motivated somebody uh, to do what I've done. And, uh, you know, I'm 77 years old, and people ask me all the time, uh, when are you going to retire? And I look at them and I say, retire from what? Uh, you know, I've only worked for anybody for four days in my life. And since that time, I have been doing what turns me on. And uh, with a little bit of luck, I'll be able to continue to do that for a longer period of time. But, you know, uh, there are a lot of hopefully, you know, real lessons to be learned. Uh, you know, I spend a lot of time talking about culture and how the culture we created in our organization uh, is very much uh, a function of, of our success. Uh, that it's a it's a culture of access and a culture of uh, you know not a violating of the eleventh commandment, which is thou shalt take, not take oneself seriously. And every day, you know, nobody should laugh at you more than you laugh at yourself. And I hope that. For those of you who read it, you'll end the read and laugh at me. And that would be terrific. I would have achieved my objective. That's great. Okay, so I don't want to get into politics, but just the midterm is coming up uh, next week, and it has a feeling of being uh, pivotal. Uh, Instead of getting specific about it, you know, we had Scaramucci here before, maybe we can talk just about themes that I, I, I've heard you talk about in the past, which have an impact, both political sphere, but have economic Im impact. So one of them would be deregulation. Do uh, you want to share your thoughts on, on deregulation with us? Well, um, you know, the Obama eight years uh, was an eight year period of time. Uh, where the businessman in the United States was demonized uh, from Obama standing up there who never made a payroll in his life or ever had a job, uh, pounding the table and telling an entrepreneur, you didn't build that. Uh, that's not a, a, a scenario that I think leads to positive results. Um, I had a conversation last week uh, with a friend of mine who runs a regulated industry. And I asked him, what was the thing, what, what's the difference been? And he said, for the eight years of the Obama administration, we spent all of our time with the regulators discussing how much the fine would be and how we might be able to mitigate the amount of the fine. And since that time, we spent all of our time, how do we avoid, you know, getting into the zone where a discussion on a fine is relevant? And instead of how can I trip you up, it's how can I help you, and most important of all, how can I help you grow and grow the economy? That's a dramatic change in uh, philosophy, change in orientation, and much more in line with the 200 years of success America had by encouraging innovation and encouraging taking risk and encouraging building for the future. 
And um, I guess uh, towing off that theme, you've got the tax cuts as well. Well, I mean, there is no rational explanation for the United States having massively higher income tax rates on corporations than its competitors on a worldwide basis. And that led to a lot of, uh, you know, Apple uh, selling their patents to an Irish uh, entity, so therefore the Irish entity could avoid tax in the U.S. at a too high a rate. I think those kinds of changes, uh, you know, anything that increases transparency, increases uh, the predictability of our society is positive. Anything that avoids Rube Goldberg schemes that are non-productive uh, are very positive. I think the tax cut not only is stimulative, but I think it's also um, appropriate under the circumstances. Right. So you've had, I guess, a change in tone. There's, there's more confidence. There's more positivity. You've also had, you know, growth but not necessarily amazing growth. And so I don't know if you want to share your thoughts on where, where you think well, we are and where we're going in the economy. Wait a minute. I mean, I don't know what the word amazing is, but uh, four short years ago, uh, I was explaining in great detail how the U.S. economy had changed and that growth beyond 1.8% was no longer achievable. And that what we needed to do was adjust our thinking and adjust our expectations to a much lower growth rate. Uh, I never understood why anybody took that position other than if you over-regulate the economy and you over-impact uh, business, uh, business will react by not investing and not growing. So uh, I think it's very interesting that, uh, you know, as recently as three or four years ago, 2% uh, growth was considered a real achievement. 3% uh, was mystical. And yet, we've now had 3.5% and 4.2% of growth. And I think much of that growth is attributable to change in attitude. And if you're an investor, as I am, or many of you out there, you're making a bet on tomorrow. And the question is, you know, how realistic is tomorrow? How rational will you be able to predict tomorrow and therefore allocate capital accordingly? To the extent that you're unhappy or uncertain, you're going to withhold and uh, the economy will feel it. And I think that's what the last 10 years has all been about. Um, I'm not a, I've known Don, Donald Trump for many, many years. Uh, I've never been a partner with him, although I've had the opportunity. Uh, I'm not a fan of the way he chooses to communicate. Uh, but if you focus on what he has done in his presidency so far, not what he said, uh, I think he's been very effective at changing the direction, particularly of the United States economy. Right. Um, uh, just before we move on, one more thing. Uh, you've had some interesting views on interest rates, because I guess it's a, it's a timely topic with, with rates going up. So do you, before we move to the, uh, I want to get to your secret sauce in a second, but maybe before we yeah, move Yeah, well, but I mean, you know, um, I, there's, a, there's a publication in the United States called Grant Interest Rate Advisors, which is really the, you know, the Bible on interest rates in the United States. And a few years ago, uh, I was reading it, and uh, there was a story that uh, Grant had gotten a call from a friend of his, and they were talking about interest rates. And the friend said that, you know, basically, basketball was saved by the shot clock. And that, you know, prior to the shot clock, in professional basketball, uh, Syracuse had built, beaten Minneapolis by a score of 17 to 16. And the next day, the owner of the Syracuse Nationals created the shot clock. 
in the same manner, zero interest rates, I don't think are good for growth because I think interest rates create senses of urgency. To the extent that we're in an environment where there is no sense of urgency, there is no penalty for doing nothing. That's not a very healthy environment. And so I've basically taken and continually stated that, it, that I didn't think that we benefited from these ultra low interest rates because they didn't lead to people taking risk. They led to people saying there is no risk in taking no risk. And to the extent that a society operates on a thesis that there is no risk for taking no risk, that is not a society that is going to prosper and move forward. Okay. So I want to talk uh, for a couple of minutes about your secret sauce. You know, I, I read the book, and the one thing that I loved is that you talk a lot, it, it, you somehow managed to distill it down into something that makes a lot of sense. You talk a lot about supply and demand. And it seems as though, you know, you, you reduce things to analyzing how much supply is out there. And if it, you know, that's economics 101, which I guess most of us slept through. But uh, in the 70s, you noticed that there was too much supply and you moved to the side, you had the guts to move to the sidelines and you did very well as a result of that. And then you did it again in the 80s and, and the 90s. And so it's obviously not that you're lucky. You've got to be a little bit smart. So we have a lot to learn from that. So two parts of this question. Um, since there's a lot to learn from history, uh, can we maybe just have a little bit of an understanding of what you saw in those times, like in the 70s, or, or pick whichever one you want, but uh, what did you see in your analysis that led you to move to the sidelines? Well, but let's back up and let's deal with something that's just even more basic. And that back up, that back up basically puts you into the word competition. We all went to school, we were all told competition is really terrific. And I, for one, am very much in favor of competition, particularly for you. Me, I like monopolies. <laughs> and if I can't have a monopoly, at the minimum, I want an oligopoly. But the idea that generating or identifying areas to invest in where there are a lot of other people trying to do the same thing really tests your credibility. So I think that from the very beginning and I, you know, I went into Econ 101 at the University of Michigan and a professor had written across the board, supply and demand. I'm not sure that there was anything else to be learned in that class. And that if you mastered supply and demand, uh, its relevance was completely relevant in everything and anything you were doing. So I looked at it and you talk about a secret sauce. Um, my secret sauce is that I didn't know how I was going to excel if I went in the same direction as everybody else. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, if you go look at the Forbes 400 um, and you take out about a 25 or 30% of the people who inherited the money, all the rest of the people on the Forbes 400 went left when conventional wisdom went right. And that obviously is directly related to the fact that you can't produce high margins if you and everybody else are doing the same things. And if you're going to create capital, I started with nothing, you have to create capital by identifying areas and methodologies where you can achieve exponential growth and thereby build capital uh, by virtue of your activities. So um, everything I did was focused on competition. And so, for example, uh, you know, we are the largest owner of multifamily housing in the United States. Uh, when we took that company public in 1993, the, the enterprise value of the company was $835 million. Um, 
At that time, the U.S. was recovering from the excesses of the 80s, and it was our thesis that we ought to buy everything in sight. And uh, particularly because we could buy everything in sight at less than it cost to reproduce. And that was another way of dealing with competition. But as we got toward the end of the 90s, we also began to see a change in demographics, and particularly on deferral of marriage. So I graduated from college, and I got married 10 days later. 95% of the people that I knew at the time followed roughly that same track. Today, the average age of a marriage is 10 years later than it was in the 60s. Well, that's creating a different level of consumer. And so, and we identified that consumer for a lot of reasons, including extraordinarily high disposable income as what we wanted to target. And so we went from owning 235,000 suburban apartment projects that were expressway frontage, which was a big plus, to 100,000 CBD high-rise units where the issue is what's the walking score. But the competition and the difficulty of creating each one of those high-rise projects was three and four times as complex as adding another suburban project. And so, once again, we were moving from where there was lots of competition to where competition was limited. When we became grave dancers or buyers of distressed property, the, nine, the major thesis was we were buying properties at material discounts to replacement cost. Now, that really comes down to if I own an office building and I buy it for 50 cents on the dollar, that means that in order for somebody to build an office building to compete with me, it costs them 100. And the difference between 50 and 100 is my competitive advantage. That's my edge. That's my barrier to entry. So when we redid that apartment project company, we went from 35 markets to six. Boston, New York, Washington, LA, San Francisco, and Seattle. All markets with barriers to entry. All markets where our vulnerability to competition is less. And that's as good and, and just as applicable in real estate as it is in rail cars. In the 80s, we consolidated the used rail car business in the United States. The logic was very simple. Oversupply of cars, cars trading for 20 and 30 cents on the dollar, yet loadings were flat, like the dead person, like the, like the dead person's EKG. But if you do a line and you see scrappings going like this, loadings like this, when they come together, uh, you're going to make a lot of money because ultimately rates have to go up to justify new construction. That's true in real estate, true in rail cars, true in containers, true in many other fields. But that's the way we've approached and attempted to produce exponential results. Okay, so you just, you've given me a pitch straight down the middle because um, equity lifestyle. Uh, you, you, you made a big move into manufactured homes. It's your top performing public company. Uh, why, why is that asset and why is that industry doing so well? Um, the, uh, the company is called ELS, or Equity Lifestyles, was originally manufactured home communities. 
I took it public in 1993. Um, and it was a, the asset class that existed that was extremely attractive and yet had a, an extraordinarily bad name. Whenever anybody talked about manufactured housing, they had Marlon Brando walking around and a wife beater yelling, Stella, and the cactuses were being blown down the road. But the reality is, it was a fabulous business. And we became the largest player in the business and took it public in 1993. Since 1993, if you had bought a share, you would have earned a 17% compounded rate of return over 25 years. The number one performing REIT on the New York Stock Exchange. And I could give you all kinds of esoteric uh, uh, mumble jumble about why, but it really comes back to what was on that that board when I walked into Econ 1. A 1, it was called supply and demand. Mobile home parks fall into this wonderful category called not in my backyard. So that means that supply is and continues to be constrained, even though demand is increasing. If you ever find another business where supply is constrained and demand is increasing, I would strongly recommend you go for it. Unfortunately, what I've just described is probably the only part of the real estate, commercial real estate business that fits that description. But, you know, it, it's not that it's hard to build a mobile home park, but at least over the last 30 years, uh, you know, it's great. I think, you know, it's like, it's like the ultimate oxymoron is affordable housing. Uh, you know, I'm in favor of affordable housing. You're in favor of affordable housing. Problem is you can't build affordable housing. And, I mean, and it's, it's not, you know, it's, is this red, is this white? It's one or the other, but it, there's no, no myth in between that we can create that makes affordable housing affordable. Ain't no way. So, uh, you know, the longer we keep uh, perpetuating that myth, uh, the longer it'll be an, an oxymoron and, and something everybody talks about and never gets done. And the homeless problem will continue accordingly. Ultimately, the homeless problem again is supply and demand. Where is the homeless problem worse? Where demand is most constrained. Starts in the United States with California, Washington, Seattle, you know, most heavily regulated, you know, areas of the country, and the highest percentage of homeless anywhere else because there's in effect an artificial limitation on new supply, which therefore uh, impacts or limits the ability to monitor or use additional supply to mitigate rents. Okay, thank you. So most people look at you and, and they may think of you as a real estate guy. Uh, but the truth is you're, you're like the, the, word, the, the, the most ultimate um, opportunist. Uh, you, you do your analysis and you figure out where the opportunities are. And at one point you decided when you were all in real estate, you and your, your late partner decided that you were going to be 50% not real estate. And I think today you're now around 60% not real estate. So, um, so not only a real estate guy, you have meaningful positions and other things. I don't know if you want to talk about uh, energy as an example of one. Uh, what was your thesis there? And, and and, and I guess the outlook. Um, I, I hate to use uh, broad spectrums for, de for definition. Rather than you know, identify it as the energy business, uh, I think I've always been, you know, uh, one of my quotes uh, is we suffer from knowing the numbers. We've always been realists. Therefore, uh, we've always been uh, focused on, you know, assets at cheap pricing. 
So, you know, we weren't in the energy business until the energy price, you know, fell by three quarters. Then we got interested and looked for opportunities. No different than real estate, no different than you know, rail cars or supermarkets or, you know, we've consolidated radio stations, waste energy. I mean, we've consolidated all kinds of industries, uh, almost always uh, getting involved with them uh, at a point where they're in distress, where acquisitions of assets are possible, and if you fix them, there's a significant entrepreneurial reward for that purpose. So um, if you're willing to share, where do you see those opportunities today? Where is there, I guess, too much supply? Or, or I guess another way of asking the question is, are you moving to the sidelines? I think we're, we'd all be uh, well served to pay attention to what you're doing now. Yeah, I, uh, uh, the answer is I don't know. Uh, if I knew I'd be rich. Uh, there's still hope, don't worry, there's still hope. There's still time. There's yeah, still you time. got time. Yeah, there's still time. Um, but, you know, but, you know when, when people ask me questions like that, I tend to answer them by saying that uh, it's really about observation. It's really about listening to what's going on and attempting to identify from what's going on an appropriate level of risk that could convert into exponential returns. Uh, I have a lot of stories in my life about opportunities being brought to us where we saw something different. I mean, when the mobile home park business was brought to us in 1984, uh, I was one of the largest real estate players in the United States, but I was also the only one who ever heard of a mobile home park. So by virtue of the fact that I was looking at something that nobody else had heard of, it created an opportunity for me, uh, and I took advantage of it. My advice to you and to anybody who asks is uh, you have to be wide open to opportunity. I never not return a phone call. I ne there's no such thing as, as uh, uh, a letter that doesn't get to my desk. Uh, and I can give you examples over the years of things that you know, bypassed everybody else, but got my attention and made me take certain steps that led to, you know, very successful endeavors. So I think it's all about, you know, being wide open, uh, you know, being transitory, uh, creating a, a culture where uh, everything is shared, uh, where information is not currency but it's a way of sharing uh, assets and understanding that the enemy is without. The enemy is never or should never be the guy sitting in the next desk. It should be somebody who's trying to compete with you across the street. And to the extent that, you know, uh, Abraham Lincoln supposedly surrounded himself with a team of rivals. I can't imagine how you could get, ever get anything done if you surrounded yourself with a team of rivals who instead of were competing with the enemy, were competing with each other. So I've done everything I can to perpetuate an internal environment where everybody is constantly working together. Uh, I allocate uh, equity participations in such a way that everybody participates in everybody else's deals. So everybody has an incentive to help everybody else as opposed to an incentive to compete with everybody else. What are the specific areas? I don't know. I mean, uh, you know. I think you're, like, aren't you selling uh, some multifamily, or you sold some mul well, multifamily I mean, assets? Well, uh, I mean, a couple of years ago, we sold $5.3 billion worth of multifamily. Uh, we, it was all, uh, it was the last of our suburban uh, low-rise stuff, and it allowed us to, in one fell swoop, be completely high-rise CBD. Um, as far as we were concerned, we got a, a price that, you know, approached a godfather price. Uh, we were able to succeed in our objectives. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
frankly, uh, I'm not a great believer in zero-sum games, so I hope the buyer did as well as we did as the seller. But the net-net was uh, we had made a decision as to where we thought the business was going, and like our whole history, when we make decisions, we also execute accordingly. Right. Okay, so I'm watching the clock. I hope you're having as much fun as I am at our reunion party, but so we'll probably have to answer the next question quickly because I didn't want to miss it, but you were a pioneer in uh, emerging markets investing, and I, I know that you used to be a fan of uh, Mexico and Brazil and among others. Uh, just curious to know how your thesis has changed or, or uh, what your outlook is now with emerging markets and global trade wars. And Well, I think that, uh, you know, I think I started out investing in the emerging markets with a, a level of naivete. Naive, naivete. Uh, I kind of thought that, well, I would study the markets and uh, make decisions and uh, that those decisions had a life to them. Um, and we started investing in, in the emerging markets because ultimately that's where the growth is. And, uh, and ultimately the definition of what is investing, it's attempting to share in growth that existing in places other than your own. Um, it turned out that uh, the emerging markets also, you know, went subsequent to my investing, went through a boom. And, uh, and all of a sudden I saw pricing that I couldn't justify. And so much to my chagrin, I sold, thinking that, you know, I had an obligation uh, to third party investors to maximize the value and values had gone beyond where I thought they belonged. Uh, and I sold and then the markets crashed. Uh, and then I had kind of understood for the first time that emerging markets were much, much more volatile than say Canada or the United States and that you couldn't apply the same time frames in the emerging markets as you could in more developed worlds. And consequently, I had accidentally been forced to sell because values had changed. But the reality is that I'm not sure that it makes any sense to invest in the emerging markets unless you understand that it means extraordinary volatility. And it means that you've got to take your gains when you get when they come to you, not maybe when you'd like them to be. But in the end, uh, you know, where is growth in the world going to come from? And I don't see it, you know, uh, there are 30, I think there are 35 countries in the EU. 18 of them had less people in them in December than they had in January. So their populations are shrinking. Uh, hard to invest long-term capital in environments where the population is shrinking because with that shrinking population is shrinking demand. So at the same time, one has to recognize that if you do invest in Brazil or you do invest in Mexico, you're going to see a lot more volatility. And uh, so you can't, uh, you can't do as we've often done in the United States and Canada and said, I'm going to you know, own this building forever. Doesn't work that way, particularly in the emerging markets where the value of the currency is open to change all the time, something we're not used to uh, in the developed world. Okay, so I can see we've got four seconds left. I'm going to take a liberty. We'll try and go one minute over because when I asked Mo, uh, how have I done my job so I can get a good review to come back for our next reunion party, he said that everybody needs to leave here with an actionable investment idea. So I'm going to put you in a tough spot. I hope you don't mind. It's the lightning round. I'm going to ask you two questions. The first, if you could buy only one thing today, what would it be? I don't know. Not the Tribune, I know. You don't know. I don't know. I mean, I would, I would be looking for things that uh, are probably out of favor, looking at things that uh, cost more to replace and that there was demand for them to be replaced. I mean, I could probably buy a coal plant at 20 cents on the dollar, but I'm not sure that there's any demand in the future to build a new coal plant. So I think you got to plug me into your thinking. Okay. But I think it's, it's constantly, frankly, trying to figure out the opposite of what you guys are doing. 
Because <laughs> so the grave dancer's still dancing. He it's, hasn't found the next and, thing. And frankly, is, is that too subtle? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Maybe this will be easier to answer. If you could sell only one thing, what would it be? Uh, overpriced assets. <laughs> Tough, huh? All right, maybe for our next anniversary. Next year we can dance. Uh, next year we'll dance. Okay, fine. So we actually, we're out of time. Sam, I want to take a moment to sincerely thank you for coming back again uh, to speak to us. I'd like to believe you came back because it was our anniversary, our reunion party, yeah, but I, I know. Uh, for sure. Because we're best buds. Yeah. Um, and I'm getting a music box. Yeah. Not Mo. Uh, but I know that in reality, Sam, you're here because you believe in Sadaka, which is charity. Uh, you believe in living a life that um, is a life that where you have a Shem Tov, which means a good name, uh, which I guess what you learned from your parents. And that's why you're here. And we're happy that you choose to live those values and the world is better off for it. And so you're here today to give us some ideas and support Sick Kids Hospital. And we really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you.